Does society undervalue its mothers? And if so, what should we as a society do about that? That's the point Anne Crittenden makes in her book, The Price of Motherhood, why the most important job in the world is still the least valued. You'll be really interested in what Anne had to say, as well as some mothers we talked to on the street. Helping the kids out of their coats The way the babies haven't been born oh, 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 oh. Unpacking the bags and setting up And planting lilacs and buttercups oh, 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 oh. Anne, you wrote a book called The Price of Motherhood. What did you hope to accomplish with that book? Well, I hoped what came true, it's my wildest dream came true about the book, which is that it would reach a lot of women, particularly in their 30s and 40s, uh, talking about how we need to put more value on the work of raising children. And why do you think there's a, a disconnect between this, that the women who are staying home and raising children feel so undervalued, so unappreciated, and so disconnected from the business world around them? Well, I think they feel that way because it's true. <laughs> um, we just haven't, a, a, it just isn't part of mainstream life. In a way, I think having kids the way we do it in America and, and having to stay home pretty much isolated raising your children is like a vestige of the 19th century separate spheres. You know, women have their place in the home, men have their place in the world. And we've gotten rid of that very well for people without children. But when you have a child, you're sort of thrust back into that artificial separation from the rest of society, I think. Well, this show really came about because of my reading your book and our subsequent conversations, and young women saying to me, how do I balance it? How do I have a kid and stay in the workforce? What do you tell them today? How can they have a kid and stay in the workforce if they want? And how can they stay home and not feel guilty? Well, that's about the hardest question facing anybody who has a child and who has a, a career or work they need to do or their income they've got to keep having. So I, there's no easy answer to that. And I think one of the problems is in the United States it's harder than in any other co uh, developed country because we just haven't adjusted uh, our working hours, for instance. It's now we virtually lost the 40-hour work week. So if you have a serious profession, you can't work 40 hours and get away with it. We just, it's not, they haven't adjusted. You have no time for life. So a lot of people just give up the ghost and have to stay home. But I also hate, yeah, I hate to discourage anyone. Who, I just tell them, stand up for yourself, be yourself. And if you feel someone is making it more difficult than it ought to be, try to speak up because that's the way change is made. I'd like to ask you each, if you're stay-at-home moms, if you are stay-at-home moms, do you feel that there's any stigma attached to it? And if you're ever planning to go back to work if you did work? I am actually on uh, parental leave right now, so I'm not a full-time stay-at-home mom. I'll only be a stay-at-home mom until January. Um, and I absolutely believe there's a stigma against stay-at-home moms entering the workforce. Absolutely. What kind of work are you on leave for? I'm a nuclear physicist which is usually, it's, well, obviously a very male-dominated field. So parental leave is usually not smiled upon. And how long do you take it, and what, uh, what occasion caused you to ask for it? Uh, actually, my husband and I are finalizing an adoption, so we're, we're doing it for that reason. But I also took leave when he was born for about six months. And, and it, the, the college where I teach is very supportive, but the overall community, the research community, doesn't really understand it. And what about you? Um, I am a stay-at-home mom, and I, I also um, am an academic. I have a PhD, but I feel like at this point, I mean, I'm having another child now. I definitely feel like there's a stigma attached to it. I feel very self-conscious about it when, um, you know, like in social settings when people say, so what do you do? And I have to say, well, we have a two-year-old. You know, that sort of <laughs> speaks for itself, and then the conversation sort of ends there. You're an example of what you write about. You have traveled the world, you're married, you have a son who's now grown. How did you manage it all when you were younger and, and trying to make it all happen? I didn't. I failed, I failed like and so many people. No, I was at the New York Times, which was a wonderful place to work, but they had no flexibility in those days. They do now. Uh, but I was expected to go back after my son was born as if nothing had happened. I call it baby as appendectomy model. Yeah. 
And I couldn't do it. My husband was working 24-7. And I wanted to spend time. I was over 40. I was madly in love with this baby. And I could not go back and turn him over to someone else and never see him, you know, which would have been the situation. So I quit my job. I didn't realize how serious the move that was. And I never got back in. I mean, I started freelance writing. So I really lived what I'm talking about. Were you just petrified when you quit that job? I mean, the most, one of the most prestigious newspapers in the world. I wasn't petrified. I thought, okay, you know, this isn't such a big deal. But I, I didn't realize how rigid it really is out there in the job market. And I found out in spades about two or three years later, I was at a cocktail party or something. But anyway, uh, this guy comes across the room, very friendly. He's not putting me down. He came across and he said, hey, didn't you see, it used to be Ann Crittenden. And I go like, I have got to write about this. You know, I went from being, you know, moderately famous or whatever to being invisible, totally nothing, you know. So it was pretty big shock. That was the petrifying part. But I mean, did that just shake your self-confidence? Did you go, oh my yeah. gosh, it's like nothing ever happened? Yes, it did. I mean, it's it's truly unnerving to be nobody suddenly, you know. And a lot of people have that experience. I can't tell you how many people have identified with that experience, you know. Whatever you're doing, there's just so much less recognition or appreciation when you're raising a kid. Do you feel that uh, <laughs> society has a hard time valuing the work that moms do by staying home? Yes, I do, actually. Sometimes I feel like I have to tell people that I used to work or that I do have a college degree or so that I can feel like I'm a valid person, you know. So it's too bad, though, because <laughs> I think what I'm doing, it wasn't just like, oh, I'm going to give this up for a while. It was really thinking, you know what? This is the most important thing. No one else can do it for me. You have a son who's how old now? He's 24. He's 24. 24. So how has he benefited, in, you know, from from what he's learned from mom? What kind of young man will he be going out looking at valuing women and mothers? My favorite story about him, though, I must say, is he was uh, ornery when he was a teenager, you know. And one time I was working hard on the book and without any idea that anyone would ever read it, you know. And he comes into my office. I'm at my computer, and he said. You know, you just sit in front of a computer all day. He said, that is so pathetic. You have such a pitiful life. <laughs> he said, I would never want a life like that, you know. I, at that moment, just really wanted to let him have it. I said, felt like a saint. I said, you just wait and see. It's, I'm doing something important. You wait and see. Well, flash forward three years, I did a reading at the big independent bookstore in Washington. Huge crowd. They sold a ton of books. And he was there filming the event. And the next morning, he came in my office and he said, you know, Mom, you worked really hard on that book. And he said, you never gave up. And it paid off. It worked. And he said, I am so proud of you. And I just thought, I can die now. Yeah. <laughs> I've given him the best lesson. Never give up. So I hope he got that out of this. You've told us you're a stay-at-home mom. Can you talk about balancing your life? Well, I'm not sure that my life is very balanced, but I did have my daughter when I was in my 30s, and I felt that it was very important to stay at home with her, and I do think it's the most important job in the world. So I did a lot of stuff before I had her in my 30s, and I personally don't think you can do it all at the same time and have it all at the same time. But I do think you can do it all and have it all at different points in time. So right now I'm dedicated to being Juliet's mommy and we have a good time together and we do lots of educational stuff like coming to the Central Park Zoo. You talk about leadership beginning at home. Um, what are some of the two or three leadership tips that would come to mind if, if you had to share them? about how you can lead at home and also transfer that to business, or, business. Or, or a larger society. I think it's really interesting that a lot of studies show that female executives are very good at mentoring other people. And I suspect it comes from a lot of people's experience of raising kids. Because there you are telling people, be the best you can, the little engine that could, which someone has described as the best business book of all time. You can do it, you can do it. And if you're used to telling children that, you might make a very good manager in encouraging people to produce, the, do their best. <laughs> Listening respectfully is huge.
Uh, former Governor Ann Richards is the one who told me that. She raised four kids and was one of the most popular governors of Texas. And she really said the biggest lesson was listening. Um, I think also a sense of perspective. If you've raised a child, you know that the worst thing that can happen is not what happens in the office. If it's something horrible happens to your child. And that gives you a kind of cooler view, I think, of crises that may occur at work, you know, some memo is badly written or whatever. It's not the end of the world. How can we really mentor each other through some of these problems, you know, that, that we face? through staying home, through getting back to work, through um, getting a part-time job, through creating flex time. There are so many issues. How do we help each other? Well, I think this, the way you begin helping each other is not hurting each other and not criticizing one another. And one of my biggest uh, bet noirs is this mommy war thing that the media promotes. But it's also enough reality to it that it has legs. Women who work are often critical or condescending toward women who stay at home. And women who stay at home are often critical of mothers who work full time. And they say, oh, they must be neglecting their children. Well, guess what? I think they're both doing a darn good job, you know. And we need to stick together because divided, we are conquered. If we don't hold together that way and help support each other, we're never going to get the kinds of social uh, policies that really will make it easier to combine work and family. And we'll collect the moments one by one. I guess that's how the future's done. Oh, 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 oh. How many acres, how much light tucked in the woods and out of sight.